Welcome everybody to Amazing Animal Adaptations. We'll be getting started in a few minutes. If you have any questions, please feel free to use the chat box and uh, we'll be happy to try and answer them for you. While we're waiting for everybody to log in, we're just gonna keep the camera here on the Canada Lynx enclosure. You may see them wandering around. We'll be getting started in just one minute. We'll see if the lynx decide to come by while we're waiting for them here as we sit and look at the Canada lynx enclosure down at the main wildlife park in Gray. All right, we're going to go ahead and get started now. We're going to go down to Jade, who is at the main wildlife park. All right, good morning, everyone, and welcome. My name is Jade, and I am an educator for the Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife here in Maine. And today we're at the wildlife park um, in Gray. And here at the park, we have all different species of main native animals. We have black bears and moose, different raptors, um, snakes and turtles, the lynx that is here behind me, as well as um, bobcats and lots of small mammals like beavers and porcupines. Um, so all kinds of different species that are native to Maine and all the animals that are here can no longer live in the wild. They are non-releasable um, for a number of different reasons. Some of them are orphaned. Um, they and were injured. Snakes right behind you, actually. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh, there she goes. Never mind. <laughs> Hopefully, they'll come in and out and say hello a few times. But um, so all the animals here were um, injured, orphaned, sometimes even illegal pets that were hand reared by people. Um, but none of them can live in the wild on their own anymore. So they live here at the park. And if you want to learn more about the wildlife park, you can visit. MainWildlifePark.com. Today we're going to focus on a bunch of different types of adaptations which are characteristics that different animals have to help them survive um, in different habitats, climates, and even different ways that they eat or avoid being eaten. Um, so adaptations can be either a physical adaptation or a behavioral adaptation. Physical adaptations are things like our thumbs and fingers. So we can use them to grab and hold on and open things, um, just like a raccoon or a possum um, has kind of little fingers for holding and grabbing different things. We also have behavioral adaptations, such as hiding the last piece of pizza or hiding food from others. And this is similar to how squirrels will gather nuts and they will hide them um, for later when they don't have as much food. So some behaviors and some physical and a lot of those um, work together. 
So this is an animal, this is the snapping turtle. And this is an example of both some behavioral and physical adaptations working together. So they have that physical body that is blending in, um, really great camouflage, long necks and a sharp jaw. And they also have this special tongue and it is like a fishing lure. So while the rest of their bodies blends into the pond or lake that they're in, that tongue stands out and a fish is gonna come along and try and eat that. And instead the snapping turtle is going to lunge and grab that fish. So some behavioral and physical adaptations working together to help that snapping turtle find and catch its next meal. As we go along today, I'm going to give some clues to a mystery adapter. So pay close attention and at the end, we'll see if you can guess what our mystery adapter is. Some of the first adaptations we're gonna talk about are an animal's fur. And an animal's fur can tell us what habitat it lives in, um, if that fur is for maybe wet, hot, dry, or cold climates. Um, and something that furs are very important for is camouflage um, for different seasons. So we'll look at a couple different furs and pelts. The first one we'll look at is for the beaver. So beavers are specially adapted for living in water. I have a beaver fur here. And beaver fur has two kind of unique layers to it. It has a top layer that's um, very smooth um, and a little bit like wiry and longer hairs. And that is the layer that is um, waterproof and blocks out and seals out water. And then they have a fluffier, thick, down layer underneath. And that's to insulate and keep their bodies warm. So they have some special fur adapted for their unique habitat for living in wet environments. We'll also look at a beaver skull to see some special beaver adaptations on this skull too. So they have very unique teeth. They are this bright orange color. And that is because they are enriched with iron. And the iron makes their teeth very, very strong. So this part here is the iron enriched part of the tooth because beavers do some special things where they um, can actually chew and gnaw on wood. So the iron part of this front tooth is very, very strong. And the white on the back is um, a little bit softer, a little bit less strong. So it wears down and forms this chisel shape so very, very strong teeth because they create and they change their habitats. Not a lot of animals can do that. That's very unique to beavers. We have an example of a beaver chew here. So you can see these teeth marks on this piece of wood. The beaver has completely stripped down to the, the, the dense part of the wood. And then on this end, you can see those teeth marks too how they take down these trees with those strong iron and rich teeth. And they use these to build their dams and to build their lodges, again, to alter the habitats that they live in. Another fur that we'll look at belongs to the same species that is behind me, the Canada lynx. So they are built for very cold, deep snow. They actually have extra fur on the bottoms of their feet too, to help them in those um, snowy, cold habitats that they live in. It's very thick for keeping them warm. I think we have a picture too that shows that links in their snowy habitat. And you can see how thick and fluffy that coat is. That is gonna be a nice winter jacket for them. You can also check out those really big feet in that picture. They use those feet like snowshoes so they can walk on the top of the snow and stalk and creep their prey, creep on their prey without falling through the thick snow. Another feline we have here in Maine is the bobcat. And here's a bobcat fur. It has very different markings than the lynx. It has all these spots and some striping on it. And that helps them blend in in the light and the shadows when they, again, too, are stalking and creeping up on their prey. They blend in very well. So this is a picture of a bobcat out in the wild. 
And you can see how those markings and everything help it blend in to the different shadows and highlights in their environment. You can also see how a bobcat and lynx are different from each other, some of their similarities and some of their differences. It can be really hard to tell these um, two cats apart if you spot one um, out in the wild. So again, those their coats are different. The bobcat has a lot more markings, has more spots and stripes on it. Their ears, those tufts on their ears are different. The lynx has much longer black tufts on the tops of their ears and also their feet. So I talked about how big the lynx feet are. The bobcats have much smaller feet because the bobcats are not living in the deep snow um, quite like the lynx are. Those lynx will be in um, northern or western Maine where we get a lot more snowfall. The next fur that we'll look at is for a coyote. So the, the first picture is the coyote here at the wildlife park. And you can see their fur too helps them blend in. It's also very um, thick for the winter, for keeping nice and warm. And I have a coyote fur here also. And again, you can see it's very long, very thick fur. That's gonna help them in the main winters. They also have very long legs. So coyotes can cover a lot of ground when they're looking for, um, their next meal cover a lot of ground. And similar to that, lynx has the thick fur um, for blending in and for staying warm. The next picture here is of a short-tailed weasel. This is an ermine. And this is a picture of this animal um, during the warmer months, so in the summer or the spring. And they're very interesting because their fur actually changes color and this fur here is that a fur from the winter. So it's the same animal, but their fur changes color for their seasons because the habitat changes. So it's a really extreme change from that brown fur for blending in in the, the spring and the summer. And then when there's snow, they get this bright white fur for the new season. Squirrels also have some cool color variation going on. They have something called counter shading. So their top sides of their bodies and their underbellies are drastically different. The top side will be a darker color and the bottom will be um, like a brighter white color. And that counter shading helps um, them in, when they're climbing through the trees or they're in the snow in their habitats also. So some other cool fur adaptations. Some furs are not for blending in or for camouflage, but instead they stand out. So this fur here belongs to an animal that I'm sure a lot of us have seen at night. This is a skunk and they have these bright white stripes because they are nocturnal. So they're more active at night. And it, this white stripe stands out in the dark. And this is a warning sign. We know that skunks spray so they also have this marking that says, stay back, warning, don't mess with me, I will spray you. So it kind of goes with their nocturnal um, habits of knowing that this white is gonna stand out in the dark and be that warning sign to keep back. We're gonna look at the first mystery adapter clue. And it is about the mystery adapter's fur. They have a mostly grayish brown fur and it helps them blend in to their forest habitat. I have a small section of fur here from one of these animals from the mystery adapter. And again, it's cut, this one's more gray, but they also have some dark um, brown or black fur too for blending into the forest and the trees. So not all animals have fur though. There are other animals that have different um, things covering their bodies other than fur. Do you know what other things can cover an animal's body besides fur? So some animals have scales, feathers, and special skin. And they have different adaptations for surviving in different environments. So just like fur, 
Um, they have adaptations for cooling, for warmth, camouflage, and more. The first ones we'll look at are feathers. So feathers help birds survive similar to, similarly to fur on mammals. And there are a lot of different types of feathers. Here we'll look at a down feather. So just like those thick winter coats, these down feathers are going to be a warm base for that bird. And it's just like um, our blankets and our jackets, how we'll um, actually use these down feathers or um, like a synthetic down to keep us warm. This also helps keep the birds warm at the base of their bodies. They also have feathers for flight. Flight is very important for birds' survival. They need to fly to be able to hunt. It makes it so a lot of birds can nest off the ground and fly away from predators. And these are two very different types of feathers. So this is a flight feather. This is from an owl. And then this is the down feather. So birds will have both these types of feathers on their body, but they serve very different purposes. Turtles, fish, frogs, and snakes are cold-blooded animals. So instead of needing fur or feathers to keep them warm and to warm themselves, they actually use their environment. So they use the sun to warm themselves. They have scales and they have shells that protect them from other dangers in their environment as well. We'll look at a turtle shell here. This is a snapping turtle shell and it's very hard and that provides um, an armor to protect the turtle. It also is camouflage. So like we saw in that snapping turtle picture, this will help them blend into their habitat um, and hide from predators or hide when they're trying to catch prey. And here is a box turtle. So turtles um, use that shell, like I said, for protection. The box turtles have adapted even beyond um, other turtle shells. They actually have a hinge on the front part of their shell that allows them to close up even further inside of their shell than a lot of other turtles. And that's partly how they get their name, the box turtle, because they can close in there like a box. And these turtles are actually um, endangered in Maine. So the Eastern box turtle is an endangered species in Maine. Um, they've lost a lot of their habitat from us building our homes and towns, um, but people also want them as pets. So we always ask you do not take wildlife from the wild. These um, turtles belong out in the wild, so do not pick them up and bring them home as pets. And if you see one of these box turtles um, out and about in Maine, you cite one of these, let the department know, because we are trying to track their populations and help these turtles out. Another interesting skin here is a snake skin. So snakes have scales and their scales actually cover all the way up to their eyes. So if I get this close enough, you can see these round circles, the clear circles at the top are the scales that would actually cover all the way up to their eyes. And this is the top part of the body. So these are the top scales. And then these are the scales underneath. And snakes, as they um, grow and everything, they shed their skin and it leaves a nice um, fresh scales underneath. It's very similar to our, our hair and our fingernails and everything that they grow with us and we can lose it and it grows back. Fish also have scales. They also have a mucus that protects their bodies from drying out and from um, their environment. This, are, this is a rainbow trout. Frogs also are covered in a mucus that helps them from drying out. And toads have tiny bumps on them. So some special skins on those animals as well. They can also help them camouflage. So this is a gray tree frog. And they are really, really good camouflage experts. If I was walking past this tree, I would have no idea that there was a frog sitting on it unless I was looking very closely for this specific frog. I have another mystery adapter clue. And they have this mystery adapter has a special um, kind of teeth. They also have orange iron enriched teeth for chewing on trees. 
similar to that beaver skull that we looked at. That's another mystery adapter clue. We're gonna look at some iconic main animal adaptations now. The first that we'll look at are very big, and I have a very big prop for this animal. This, of course, is a moose antler. So it's different than a horn. Antlers and horns are very different. Antlers um, are grown and shed at different parts of the year. And a horn stays on the animal's head um, and grows with them um, and does not shed off. So antlers shed off and horns do not. And they're very, very big. They don't carry these with them all the time. Um, moose just grow these during their breeding season, during the rut. And just the bull moose grow, grow those. So the bull moose is the male moose, they're the boys. And they grow those during the mating season. And then they fall off um, after the mating season is over and then they'll start growing their new antlers again later in the spring. And they also have some different coats. So they have a winter coat and they have a summer coat because that winter coat would be way too hot in the summer and their summer coat would not keep them warm enough in the winter. And they have these very unique hairs. They actually have hollow hairs. And this helps the moose trap air close to their body. So it creates this warm pocket of air close to their bodies. And here I have a moose fur. And they're very dark brown. It's also very wiry. So they're gonna be moving through the trees and everything. So this thick wiry fur is gonna protect them in their environment. And again, those hollow hairs is a special adaptation that not a lot of animals have to also help keep them warm in the winter. Another iconic main animal that we'll look at are the black bears. So I have a couple of different black bear things to look at. First one I wanna look at is this black bear paw. So we see these really long claws and this fur as well. So very thick, dark fur. They're known as the ghosts of the forest. And these fur and these claws help um, them in a couple different ways. So the claws and fur help them eat one of their favorite foods. They really like baby bees and honey. So they use those um, big claws um, to get into the beehives and rip them up and get the baby bees, which are really good protein. But of course they don't wanna get stung. So they're covered in that thick dark fur and that helps them not get stung by the bees and get to those baby bees and the honey. They also use their claws for climbing. So here's a picture of a baby bear cub climbing up a tree. They're really good climbers. They'll also dig and find food. Bears are omnivores. So we're gonna look at this skull to look at um, how we can tell these bears eat both plants and animals. So we see some sharp teeth. They have those sharp canines, but they also have these back teeth that look very much like people teeth, actually. They look like human teeth quite a bit because bears, like most people, are omnivores. So they have these teeth that are for both eating plants and other animals. So a lot of different adaptations for eating some of their favorite foods like baby bees and also blueberries. They'll use their claws like blueberry rakes too and they'll sit in the blueberry fields and rake up and eat blueberries. Our third and final mystery adapter clue is that this animal also climbs trees but one of their most iconic um, adaptations is actually their modified fur follicles that will stick to any creature that gets too close to them. So I'm gonna go through each of these clues again. So the first clue is that their fur is mostly gray and brown to help blend in with the forest. They have special teeth that are orange. They are iron enriched for chewing on trees. And they are adapted to climbing trees, but they're also known for their modified fur follicles that will stick to a creature if they get too close. What do you think our mystery adapter 
could be. It's a porcupine. So I showed that fur and here we have two pictures of porcupines. The one on the ground is a porcupine here at the wildlife park. And the other one is a porcupine clinging onto that tree with their fluffy winter coat and those quills sticking out. I have a couple, I'll re-show this fur again. So this is that um, fur that covers the porcupine, just like a lot of other mammals, very um, kind of normal fur. But then we also wanna look at these modified hairs. So these are those quills. This is the modified hair I was talking about, is the porcupine quill. And these are what they're gonna stick into any animal that gets too close to them. A common myth is that these um, animals can shoot the quills off of their bodies, like a projectile, but they actually can't do that. You have to touch the porcupine to get poked with these quills. So they can't shoot them at you, um, but if you touch them, they're gonna stick in and they are tough to get out. So really good defense for those porcupines. We also talked about their teeth too. Very much like the beaver, they eat browse. So they eat the leaves and twigs and bark off of the trees. And they just leave behind, um, just like on here, they'll leave behind the bare wood on that tree and eat everything else off of it. So if you're going through the forest and you see trees that are not on like this, but not taken, taken completely off, those are probably done by a porcupine. All right, I would love to answer any questions that might have come in about animal adaptations now. So it's not necessarily about an adaptation, but um, someone was thinking, was there an albino porcupine that once lived at the park? Yeah, we've had actually a couple different um, albino animals at the park. Um, I have, when I've been here, I haven't seen an albino porcupine but I wouldn't be surprised if we did have one. Um, we currently have an albino raccoon. Um, so there's a range of different um, kind of genetic color variations that can happen. So we have a piebald deer also. So she's not completely white. She has some brown spots on her. Um, so instead of being albino, we call her a piebald because she has um, still a genetic change where she's not that brown or tan color like the other deer. She's mostly white, but I wouldn't be surprised if at one point we did have an albino porcupine because they do not do well in the wild. Albino animals are um, easy prey and they often, because that is a genetic um, disease or, or change in that animal, it can also affect other um, adaptations that they have. So our albino raccoon that's here that same um, genetic disorder also affects his eyesight, um, which of course is very important to them in the wild. So he's here because he's albino and um, I believe he was actually someone's pet as well, so. Um, another question is, are porcupines fluffy in the winter? Yeah, so if we um, could go back to that picture of the porcupine from just before of it holding on to um, the tree branches, we can see that they do get very fluffy in the winter. They have um, the same kind of fur like the lynx or the coyote, so they're going to have that fur covering their body that keeps them nice and warm. But mixed in with their regular fur are also those quills. So the quills aren't all the fur on their body, but they also have normal fur that helps insulate and keep them warm in the winter too. Um, another question is, do porcupines bite? Porcupines can definitely bite. They have very, very strong teeth. So here at the park, when we are feeding um, our porcupine or our beaver that have those iron enriched, very strong teeth, we need to be careful um, to not let them get anywhere near our fingers because just like they can chew through a piece of wood, they can also bite one of us. So you definitely wanna be careful um, if you're here at the park, we don't poke our fingers into any of those animals' spaces because 
they have a very strong bite. So even though they don't have sharp teeth like a lynx does, they have a very strong jaw and very strong teeth. Yes, and as a reminder, all these animals at the wildlife park are rescues and unable to live in the wild themselves. So it's very different from your dog or your cat in your house. Uh, we have another great porcupine question. Do porcupines hibernate? So porcupines do not hibernate. They stay active in the winter. Um, a lot of the animals here in Maine in the winter do become less active, but that doesn't mean that they are hibernating. So porcupine is still going to go out every day and be looking for food um, and moving around from tree to tree, but they might spend more time sleeping um, to conserve their energy when they are able to find less food, but they do not hibernate. That's great. And someone was asking about um, the beautiful enclosure behind you. So if you, uh, maybe you could tell us a little bit about um, this modern um, natural enclosure that's there for the lynx. Yeah, definitely. So all of our enclosures here at the park, we try to keep them as um, natural to the animals habitat that would be here in Maine. So again, all the animals that are here are native Maine species. So we don't have to um, really stretch too far to change their enclosures um, to make it like a African savanna or something like that. We try to keep them as natural to the main um, forests and habitats that they would be living in. Um, we keep real trees and we build um, different um, hideaways and spots where the animals can go to cool down or get away from just the public eye. Um, and we also do a lot of enrichment with the animals here. So the tree that's behind us, we will um, do scent enrichment with the cats. They're very sensitive to scent. So we'll do different scent enrichment. We'll hang um, boxes and different uh, crazy toys and things. And um, just like a house cat, we'll actually use some herbs like catnip um, or spices like anise. And they're very sensitive to that. It gets them very excited and using their um, natural instincts a little bit more, even though they're here as a captive animal. All right, does anybody have any other questions at this time? Uh, we'll wait maybe another second, maybe we'll see if any of the links are around. Um, but if you do ever want, you can contact us at mefishwildlife.com on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Yes, so if there's no more questions, I just wanna say thank you. Um, those were some really great questions and I hope you had fun learning about Maine's amazing animal adaptations. Um, if you wanna find more uh, virtual tours of the park or things to do at home, you can go to mefishwildlife.com and um, see previously recorded virtual tours, upcoming virtual tours and things to do at home. So thank you all again for joining us. Thank you, everybody, and please be sure to check out our other videos at mefishwildlife.com slash field trips.